Welcome to another RD Works Learning Lab. Uh, today we look as though we've got a bit of a garage sale going on. Sort of. Um, today's a bit of a mixture. I've now prepared all my pieces for the Russ spec machine to go to China and they will be leaving in the next day or two. Now between the China Blue machine, which I've spent a long time designing and gradually evolving these pieces for, and the new Tangerine Tiger, um, which I've basically taken all the pieces from China Blue and quickly put them onto the Tangerine Tiger, but at the same time it's given me the opportunity to think a little bit more about the design of one or two of the pieces. So, for example, the lightweight head that we previously had, the Mark I, has now evolved into the Mark II. And we'll go through the details of that as we progress through this session. I think we'll hold it all together with the basic principle behind why I've done all of this work. There are two main reasons. Reason one was to make beam setting as simple and logical as possible. Anybody that's been following my learning journey would have seen me sort of succeed but really fail at making a red dot pointer system which emulates the laser beam. It works sort of but not sufficient to really set the beam accurately. The only accurate way that I've found is the beam itself, scorching your way to success. That has over a period of time led me to develop various features of the machine which ensure that we can do it quickly and efficiently and that's what we're going to go through here today to hang all these things together. The second thing that was driving me was ultimately I wanted to get a fast machine but and a fast machine can only be achieved by reducing the mass that you're moving. Acceleration is the thing that's going to decide your cycle time. So if you're in a production environment doing engraving with this machine, every scan line you're going to be losing time at the end and the beginning of each scan. The shorter you can make that distance, the less your cycle time will be. So that's been the second aim of this whole project. Come on in and let's work our way through some of the pieces that are on this table. Many people do not understand the basic principles that underlie the scorch method. So what I'm going to do is to break down the method and why I've chosen these various pieces of equipment to help with this method. Basically what we're trying to do is to break down X, Y and Z into three simple stages of setting. The first thing we have to do is to align the tube with mirror one. This is actually a very easy task. Two things you have to remember. Number one, the mirror, which is mostly 25 millimeters diameter, actually has got probably a visible diameter of about 23 millimeters because it sits in a frame. Although you see that as a 23 millimeter circular diameter, the laser beam does not see it like that because it is firing at the mirror 45 degrees and when you twist a circle to 45 degrees this is what you get so it's still 23 millimeters tall but it's only probably about 13 or 14 millimeters wide when we come to line up the beam in on mirror one it really is not too important that we're fussy about getting it on center vertically we could be two or three millimeters away from center and we've got lots of scope to play with on the mirror surface itself. The thing that we do need and we need to be accurate with is alignment in the horizontal direction. Mirror one I like to call a fix-all because this mirror here happens to compensate for any off alignment of your beam. I have adopted a different approach a long time ago and I designed a plastic acrylic one piece tube and mirror one element. Here I've got the more modern version which is made of steel. It's very simple. Hey look, we do not have any adjustable tube clamps. We've got no fancy bits of foam wrapped around the tube. Now what we've got is a very simple 
construction. Here we've got an old tube um, that has been damaged and I was given but it does allow me to just use it for demonstration purposes to show you what we're going to achieve and we apply a little bit of load to it and clip a piece of plastic in so everything is nice and flexible it's completely solid and stiff and this is designed for the 55 millimeter diameter tube selfishly it's because my system is 55 millimeters diameter so there we go now we've got a tube which is mounted solidly and in one position you cannot adjust it I've nominally designed this to sit in the center of the mirror but if I've got it wrong and it's one or two millimeters high or low I'm not going to worry but what I can do is I can make sure that I set the burn to the center of the mirror by allowing the mirror adjustment in this direction so there's a screw underneath here and a slot which allows me to set the mirror up perfectly onto the vertical center line. What you will note when I point this out to you is that this surface here is all flat. And the idea is that when you put this into your machine, it sits flat on the base plate, provided I mount this against the back surface of the machine, then I can always use that back surface as a reference and I can slide this unit in the one direction that I need to move it which is in this direction here backwards and forwards right we've just reorganized ourselves so that we've got this turned around the right way and we can see that mirror number one is here now the first step is to adjust mirror one so that the beam hits mirror number two now what I suggest you do is to move mirror number two to this end and with a clean target you put a mark onto there now you may find that your mark is not in the center of the mirror it may be way off okay so now all you need to do is to move this very slightly until you get your beam onto this position so there's the use for this immediately what we're going to do is we're going to send the mirror away as far as possible and we're going to produce a mark on position B now it could well be that this mirror here is so badly set initially that the beam is actually going to disappear off the edge of mirror 2 what we need to do is just tweak this to make it come onto mirror 2 somewhere okay now once you've got it onto mirror 2 down here you know that your beam is approximately aligned we haven't started the setup procedure yet what we're trying to do is to hit the barn door we're going to move this mirror to position A and we're going to put a brand new target on there and we're going to create what I call a target burn which is a mark A okay now when you move this to the other end of the stroke what you'll find is that A is here but your beam which produced A is actually here so what you've got to do now is to fiddle with these two extreme controls never touch this one which is the bottom corner of the L to steer this beam so that you can make a coincidental burn mark A when you steered your beam across and matched A many people will think whoopee we've done it well I'm afraid it's not quite as simple as that because look in moving across onto beam A look what we've done we're no longer matching beam A at this end so we've got to move the mirror back and we've got to repeat the process two and three and two and three and two and three you need to do it at least three times because this is a process of iteration as I state at the bottom here where what you're doing is you're gradually creeping in reducing this error to a smaller error to a smaller error to a smaller error until eventually you get this beam perfectly lined up in both the horizontal and the vertical plane with your axes right so please dismiss the idea that you're ever going to be able to set this beam in one hit because 
the chances are you will not. <laughs> Realistically, three or four attempts is what is required to gradually creep in on this perfect alignment. I'll just give you a close up of the page because this is a very important page. Now it's important that you don't get hung up on the idea that you must do two things at once. There are two separate stages to aligning a mirror. The first thing is to align it to the axis. The second thing is to align the beam onto the center of the mirror. Now mirror two is no different than mirror one. As far as the laser beam is concerned, here's what it sees. It sees an, a, an elliptical shape like this. So we have to get it onto the center in the horizontal plane. And the way that we achieve moving from here to the center of that mirror without disturbing this parallelism that we've set up in the previous step is to do this. We just slide this one piece tube and mirror assembly across. It's as simple as that because this surface here is referenced against the surface of the machine so we are not going to disturb this alignment here. All we're going to do is create some horizontal motion and move the beam across into the correct position on mirror two. Now step four involves these things. I've got a couple of different heads here, but look, both of, them, both of them have got a hole in. Most people think that they should be aiming their beam for the middle of this hole. It's sort of about right, but as I found out with this mirror here, if you take a look carefully, you'll see that there's a couple of lines across there. That's where my beam has really got to be aligned because the mirror is so badly designed, it's out of position. Now, I'm afraid you really get a little bit screwed when you try and use that hole to align to that mirror because we haven't got a hole. We can see where roughly the center of that mirror is and we can just hang a little flag target down in front there as a, as a guide because at this stage we're not trying to get absolute perfection at this stage onto mirror number three. What we're trying to do remember is to set the axis parallel to the beam. And then after that, we'll set the beam true to the mirror. We only need it approximately on the mirror to start with. We do exactly the same thing as we did in step two. We fiddle with mirror number two to steer the beam so that we hit the mirror in some way at this extremity. We then come back to the close position and we put a target on there. A nice clean target and we do a target burn. Here we go, A again. So here's our target burn. And of course, when we move to the other end of the stroke, <laughs> A is nowhere near where we thought it was going to be. It's right out here. So we're gonna to have to steer this beam with the same iteration process to gradually creep that beam to a position where it's parallel with this X axis rail. It's just repeating these number two and number three steps that we had at step two. We're doing exactly the same procedure for this x-axis rail. Do not try to get the beam centered onto mirror three. That's not the aim of the first part of this exercise. It will eventually be, but not at this stage. So don't mix these two things up because lots of people try and get the center of the mirror and the beam aligned at the same time. Total failure, you'll never succeed at that. Separate the elements out. Now step number five takes me on to a completely different subject. We've now got to adjust the mirror so that the beam on mirror three is approximately, and I say approximately because it, at this stage, we are not trying to get it perfectly onto the center of mirror three. The sweet spot on the mirror which we'll talk about in the last stage, may not be the same thing. So at this stage, we're trying to get the beam approximately lined up onto the center of the mirror. You could just run it through the middle of your hole there and that will be good enough. If the beam is here, how do we raise the beam up to get it into the middle of the hole? If it's over the side here, how do we slide it across 
to get it into the centre of the hole? Well, the answer is you have to go all the way back to here with the conventional method and you adjust your tube and you fiddle with the beam until it comes into the middle of your hole here. But when you do that, you've probably screwed up your X and your Y alignments. That's the last thing you want to do. So never go backwards. Always go forwards. And that's what we've done so far. We've just moved forward in this procedure and we've got our beam in the correct position as far as the x-axis is concerned. It's perfectly true to the x-axis, but it's not lined up with mirror three. So my strategy a long time ago was when I had this head was to say what we need is an adjustable bracket that allows me to move the head up and down and in and out so that we can move the head onto the beam and not the beam onto the head. We've already set the beam up in two planes. We don't want to mess those up. And at every stage so far, if you remember, what we've done, we've moved the mirror onto the beam and not the beam onto the mirror. In the early days, I did make an adjustable bracket, an aluminium adjustable bracket that allowed me to move this head around and prove this point. It didn't take long before I decided that what we should do is make a fully proper adjustable bracket. So my early bracket that fixed to the bearing, the 15 millimeter bearing that's on my front mounted rail looked like this. And that allowed me to fix that onto the bearing rail and have Z and Y adjustment. So we could move the head to catch the beam. Now, as I said, selfishly, I'm making this for myself. But people are asking me, can I have one? But I haven't got the same machine as you. So what I've done, I've adapted my backplate design so that people with 12 millimeter systems have got the ability to find some holes in here, which will fit. And you've got several sets of holes, which will enable you to either raise or lower or move left and right. So you can find a set of holes on here to suit 12 and 15 millimeter bearing systems. This head was never designed to go on this bracket because at that stage of development of this head bracket, my other machine had already got this C-type lens system on it. And this C-type lens system is very, very flexible because it means I can use one and a half inch, two inch, two and a half, four inch. I can use all sorts of lenses and nozzles on this lens tube. And so I decided that for the purpose of uniformity of my machines, that forced the next development on, which was the lightweight head. OK, so the lightweight head looked like this and it was made of acrylic. Yeah, two millimeter acrylic. This system worked on my machine perfectly well for about two years. So this was my first really lightweight adjustable head so that I could catch the beam onto the center of that mirror. Step five uses either this bracket, which is Z and Y adjustment. This works well. When I started pushing the China Blue machine to get the fastest possible speed out of it, I needed maximum rigidity and the lightest weight that I could get. So I designed something that was extreme. And here we are, we've got a lightweight head with a 20 millimeter mirror on it. As I said, extreme. I was trying to keep the weight down to the absolute minimum. We're going to put that in there. Every time that this moves in the Y direction, there's a little sort of a kick that could happen. And so I wanted this to be mounted as stiffly as possible directly onto the bearing. And again, selfishly, this is a design that suits my machine. And I had lots of requests that says, will this fit a 12 millimeter top mounted rail? Will this fit a 12 millimeter front mounted rail? No. On the one hand, you guys are a bloody nuisance. But on the other hand, you're a pleasure because it forces me to think again, my mind is never still. I'm always looking for something better. 
And so, yes, I've been using this for probably about a year now, and it works extremely well. Now, to fit this directly onto the bearing, we need an adapter plate like this. Okay, this screws onto the bearing, and this fixes on here and allows us Z adjustment. So we can catch the beam in Z. All we need to do is put some extra holes in here, and this then screws onto a 12 millimeter system. So that means that if you had bought this bracket to do this modification, you no longer need it because this has got no locations on it or fixings to suit this situation. You have to mount it directly onto the bearing. And then I had to deal with those people that said, look, I've got a machine which has got head mounted like this on a great big thick plate. This is a C-type head mounting plate where the 15 millimeter bearing is running along the top of the gantry. And so we've got a top mounted bearing. This head and the top mounted system don't work together. This is off of my light blade machine where, again, I decided that perhaps it would be a good idea to make the lightweight head mount onto that machine as well. And I had to design a three-piece bracket that has got wire adjustment on it and Z adjustment on it to suit this heavy old head. So it had to be a fairly heavy bracket. I mean, this is a, this is a big lump to throw around. And this is never going to be a greyhound. This is always going to be a bit of a donkey. So there's the next iteration of design to suit the top mounted rail system until I had inquiries from quite a few guys that said um, I'm afraid my top bearing system is 12 millimeters so now I'm faced with another problem can I adapt this system to suit a 12 millimeter top rail system well the answer is yes with a little adapter kit we can convert this into the same mounting that would be required for a 15 millimeter. So we've just got a little adapter plate that adapts from one to the other. And then it does mean to say that you can take this element and throw it away and just have the two pieces that are left to get yourself Z adjustment and Y adjustment with the lightweight head on a top mounted 12 or 15 millimeter bearing system. <sighs> My brain hurts. This started off as a project for me, not for the world. Now, I couldn't ask Cloud Ray to make all these various combinations. Cloud Ray did manufacture and do manufacture this bracket because there's sufficient volume out there to make this a cost effective process for them. So if you've got a top mounted rail system on your gantry, be it 12 millimeter rail or 15 millimeter rail, you will need this bracket here to take a lightweight head. But if you mounted that on that plate, one of the problems that you find is you've only got Z adjustment. How do we get Y adjustment back into that system? This is the number two mirror. And what I've done is to mount this on a very substantial mounting. There's all sorts of videos that show you the reason why you want the substantial mounting for mirror two. But as well as making the mounting substantial, it's been designed with some very long spaced, very thin locators that enable this mirror to move accurately in the Y direction. So it's easy to adjust the position of your mirror accurately without affecting the alignment that you've already set up on that mirror. You don't want to adjust the alignment. All you want to do is to adjust the position that you reflect off of onto mirror number three, if you remember, that's the whole exercise. Here, we've only got Z adjustment, and here, we've got the Y adjustment on a separate axis. This is getting complicated, which is why, depending on what your situation is, you'll have to watch this video several times. Because now, I've come up with the Mark II lightweight head. It's more or less the same as the Mark I, 
So those of you that have got the Mark 1, don't get stressed because there's no major functional improvement to the Mark 2. What there is with the Mark 2 is the ability to use the standard 25mm mirror. It did force me into another change. I had to put a separate piece of material in here to force this tube onto the correct center line for the bigger mirror. I have changed slightly the way in which it's mounted. So I've now added a fourth mounting hole up the top here. This slot here has changed from a three mm M3 to an M4, but that's no big deal because if you want to mount this onto an existing bracket, it'll still take an M3 screw with a, with a washer under the head and that will still fit in there. But the great advantage is adding this extra plate in here, not only has it added stiffness, it has allowed me to use an M4 fixing screw behind there and the head will disappear and not affect this. In addition, I took the opportunity while I was designing this to allow people to go backwards if they want to. A couple of extra tabs on it which most people don't need. But if you've got a China Blue machine and you want to fit one of these on, so when we put those two mounting bolts back in there, they will enable you to accurately move this in the Y direction to catch the beam. And then you've got this adjustment here in the Z direction to catch the beam. So now we've made this lightweight head suitable for a China Blue or a front mounted rail system without the need for this Y adjustment on the mirror. This bracket was not specifically designed for mounting this mirror. The mirror was just something that came along as part of this bracket. This bracket here was for a completely different reason. You'll notice that this bracket has got bearings on it. And those bearings have allowed me to turn the belt inside out. Now my belt passes through there like that now, okay, and runs over those pulleys with the flat side of the belt against the rollers. I'm being distracted at the moment. This has nothing to do with beam alignment. So we shall put this to one side and we'll come back to this. So in trying to explain this step five, how we're going to adjust Z and Y to move the head onto the beam, there are two options that I've designed in the past. One of them is the Y and the Z adjustment on the same bracket, like that, or like that. All right, both of them require a bracket. This bracket is available from Cloud Gray, and this bracket, unfortunately, is available from me. I say unfortunately because I really don't want to be manufacturing parts, but the quantities are relatively so small that I can't ask Cloud Gray to make them. If you haven't got the adjustment of Z and Y on one bracket, then what you've got to have is Y and Z on separate axes. One of them, like this, is on the head, and the other one will be on a number two mirror holder. Now, I've shown you the number two metal mirror holder. There was also a variation that I designed, like this, made out of acrylic, which the design exists for, that allows you to mount your own adjustable mirror holder on your existing bracketry without going to the expense of the metal bracket. And the designs of that are available. They were pretty successful. I used it myself. One minor problem. A couple of people reported to me that were using high powered lasers like 100 and 120 watt lasers that the heat generated by a molybdenum mirror was actually causing transfer of heat into this acrylic back plate and causing it to soften so that the springs and the screws were actually distorting the material. If you do want to go down this route and manufacture your own bracket then please let me know because I will add into the kit 
free of charge, as well as all the screws that are required for this job, I will add a metallic mirror holder made of aluminium so that it transmits the heat energy away. We either break the Y and Z adjustments up or we keep them together on one bracket. The net result is the same. We're able to move the head onto the beam. So now we come on to aligning the Z axis. So I haven't got a Z axis on my machine. You have the table goes up and down. And if the table goes up and down, it goes up and down on lead screws. And lead screws have effectively become your axis, your Z axis. They might not be particularly accurate. Some of them are pretty wobbly, but it's still a Z axis and you're gonna to have to set it up. The way to do that is exactly the same procedure as we've done for the other two axes, except that instead of the target sitting on a mirror holder, the target is going to sit on the table. So we're no longer worried about doing this preliminary step because we can put a, sheet, a large sheet of paper on the table or a sheet of card or a sheet of wood and we can make sure that under no circumstances do we miss the barn door because the barn door is huge. Okay, now look, here we are at the machine because there are certain parts of this setup process that we can talk about. There are other parts of it that need real demonstration for you to understand and believe what I'm saying. Here's the barn door. Before I start my setting process, the one thing I must really do, I must check the mechanical part of the machine. This is a V-block, and it's a V-block that clamps this into the fixed, same fixed position every time. This is a much more reliable system than a collet or a single screw fixing because we're referencing everything to these two surfaces. The one thing that we must do is mechanically make sure that we've got this face here and this face here square to our work table. There are two reasons for that. One, we don't want to interfere with the alignment of the beam passing down the center of this axis. We can have the beam bouncing off of this mirror absolutely square with the table which is what we're going to try and do now but if this is laying off angle like that and I'm exaggerating we've got our beam running true to the table but the beam is not running true to the axis of the lens tube it's essential that you actually get this mechanically set before you attempt to do this setting process now I've already got my beam set up on this machine so I'm expecting when I introduce a barn door and I press the pulse button when I drop the table down four six inches it really doesn't matter I've already got my machine set up so I'm expecting that second mark that I put on there to be coincident with the first mark so let's do a pulse so this mirror is already set up correctly to the Z axis. That's stage one. Stage two is to make sure that the beam not only true to the table and therefore running parallel with these two faces but it's also got to coincide with the axis of the lens for most efficient use of the lens. We're going to do a little bit of an interesting uh, experiment here. So I've got a little card target here which is going to sit right into the back face of that V-block because it's the same size, 24 millimeters, as this lens tube. So the crosshair represents the central axis of the lens. So when I press my pulse button now, hmm, it's not exactly perfect. The question is, how imperfect can it be and what effect does imperfection have? That would indicate to me that the beam is, sit, is hitting the mirror too low and I really need to drop the head down to catch the beam higher on that mirror and that will force the, the burn slightly further forward. But what we're going to do is very carefully drop this down to here and repeat the exercise. Now if we've got everything running true we should find we're getting coincidence on the dots again. And there we go. We verified that the beam is actually also running true to this V-block, but it's not in the right central position. So what I'm going to do now is to grab hold of this head, and I'm going to lift the head up as high as it will go. Now lifting the head up 
mm, it's possible I might have missed the bottom of the mirror but we'll give it a try yes I have too high start with a clean target again because we're going to keep these for reference so here we go the beam is now going to hit the lens way off axis what effect is that going to have as it comes out of the nozzle so I've got a handy little tool here on which I'll put some masking tape so the beam is on that side of center line we'll use this little pocket here to check that one and we'll see how the beam is coming out of the nozzle it's very slightly over that way how does that affect the cut and I've got my test one inch square test set to 14 millimeters a second maximum power and we're getting a good cut because all the smoke is coming out underneath and we've got a beautifully clean cut no smoke on the top just a small amount of debris on the corner there where the start point is and let's turn over and see what we've got well it's not really making it through is it so we'll drop the speed to 12 millimeters a second and now we've got lots of good clean smoke coming out underneath and I expect that this one will be a good cut but it will push out now if I hold something light behind it hopefully you'll be able to see how much off angle the left and the right faces are we'll draw a little picture on here of two things first of all is our surface and here are our edges they're both coming out there and going up that way and that's when we had to the back and that was 12 millimeters a second we're now going to reset things below the ideal position I'm now expecting to see my dot on the other side of the center line and there it is now it's off axis the other way and we'll leave it at 12 millimeters a second because we know that that just about dropped out it's a slightly better cut but it's about the same it's not a hundred percent perfect so we'll push that out now and we'll carefully make a note of where the front edge is there and this time you'll note that the off angle is going the opposite way angles this time that go that way and that's resulted from having the beam set off axis in that direction so they don't look a lot different even though we've moved the axis from one side to the other the beam coming out of the nozzle has really not changed its position which is rather surprising I've adjusted this roughly to the center of its stroke we're just going to do a quick pulse to see what my setting has achieved but well, there we go that's near enough for what we're trying to prove we've now got the axis of the beam running down the axis of the lens tube technically meaning it should be running through the axis of the lens if it runs through the axis of the lens then it should be coming out of the nozzle centrally it's wandering around a little bit it's a little bit different than what it was before but we haven't got any huge movement of the beam as it comes out of the nozzle we'll have a little bit of a chat about that result after we've finished our tests here the speed at 12 millimeters a second and we'll see what result we get here's a marginal improvement so I think you'll now see that relatively speaking those faces are pretty upright okay now to save time I've drawn a summary of what we found when we move the beam off axis on this side we get a we get a deviation which sends the beam across this way because that's what we're getting we're getting cut offset which looks like that now when we move the beam the other way just to confirm the situation we get cuts that go that way so we can clearly see that the beam gets diverted in these directions when we move it off center 
the biggest problem that I have and have always been puzzled about is why when we move the beam off so far and we can produce such huge angular changes to our cut do we still get the beam coming out of more or less but not quite the center of the nozzle we don't get huge variations in the beam as it comes out of this nozzle power is not being clipped by this nozzle because we're still able to do the same amount of virtually the same amount of damage to material regardless of whether we've got the machine set badly or correctly so the only advantage that we have of setting the beam correctly is straight cuts theory says that we should have abysmal cutting on each of these positions and probably if we go too far we won't even get the beam out of the nozzle you get this impression that we must have the beam set perfectly we don't need to have the beam set perfectly through the axis of the lens to get cutting we need the beam to be running perfectly through the axis of the lens to get upright cutting that's the conclusion that we can draw from this demonstration this is not theory this is fact so there we go that's beam setting for you and as I said to you the most important part of this exercise is what happens at this last stage the Z setting now I already have a couple of people asking me <coughs> can I have one of these please well the answer is yes of course you can how much do you want to pay in its own right it doesn't cost a fortune I mean this whole assembly here is probably something like about 12 maybe 15 pounds to have this made I made half a dozen of them so that's the cost to me if you made one it could be 60 or 100 pounds but it does mean to say I've got a few that I could sell if you're prepared to pay the price not that that's a huge amount of money there's some other factor that comes into this which begin to double the cost <coughs> and that's this little mirror on the end here and that, these mirrors they're a bit like gold dust you can't really buy them as is but what you can do is you buy them as a little assembly and the cheapest I could buy this is a number one mirror the cheapest I could buy this number one mirror assembly was about 16 pounds from China and by the time I paid import tax on it as well which I had to it was close on probably 18 or 20 pounds so this is not cheap this is relatively cheap so say 16 and 20 pound that's already 36 pounds now how am I going to get it to you well that depends where you are in the world because shipping of an item like this is a stupid amount of money the cheapest I could find to ship this to America for example was something like about 26 or 28 pounds well that again doubles the cost we're now up to 58 60 pounds for this unit and, and I, I really can't see that the value is in it for you guys but you know you can have the drawings you can make something yourself I have no problem with you going away and making your own design to copy this these designs are free and available to anybody that wants to try and do them if you haven't got the facilities and you're prepared to pay the money then yeah I'll send you one it's not quite as simple as just dropping this in a plastic bag and sending it because what we've got here is the packing case I've had to make for it it's beautifully made even though I say so myself it's a little telescopic box with the unit inside And that will all have to be taped up and shipped to you you won't get charged for the box you won't get charged for my time so I think what I'm going to have to do is for this item I'm going to have to put a cost on this item and then I'm going to, have to add to it the postage for your part of the world so that those people that live just down the road don't get charged a silly amount of money because even in the UK it's going to cost somewhere somewhere in the region of about 10 or 12 pound to ship this maybe even more now a long time ago 
I found out that my China Blue machine had a really strange problem that I couldn't get rid of. And that was a problem that I called curtains. And you can see in the background here, these lines, regular lines. That's what I call curtains. What is it? It was suggested at the time that it was something to do with the stepper motor. Well, I'm afraid that didn't turn out to be the case. Fundamentally, if we take a look at the pitch of the belt and the pitch of those lines, you'll see that they match. What we're getting here is an impression of the timing belt. As the belt goes onto the pulley teeth, there is a change in velocity of the belt. Okay, now let's just draw a surface here for a minute. The laser beam is constant power. So if I set it to a power and a fixed speed, then what it will do, it will cut a groove, a constant depth, like that. If the laser beam is not running at a steady speed, but in fact going fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow, fast, slow. When it's going fast, what it will do, it will, it will draw a line, it will draw a cut depth like this. Steady speed, slow. Fast, slow. Fast, slow. As it goes slower, it allows the beam to cut deeper. When it goes fast, it cuts shallower. So what we have here in, the, in this laser beam is a fantastic velocity plotting machine. And so that tells me clearly that these patterns that I'm getting in here are all to do with a, a juddery motion. And that juddery motion perfectly matches the timing belt. You don't need to be Sherlock Holmes to work out the relationship now. The problem was how to fix it. How do we get rid of this jumpy motion? The way to overcome the problem, which I eventually discovered, was to turn the belt over. If you have got a belt which is flat, running round pulleys which are flat, you cannot get teeth causing the belt to go faster and slower as it engages with each tooth. So, how does turning the belt over cure this problem, I hear you ask? Well, if I'm going to run a flat surface around flat bearings, then I'm not going to get any belt jumping every time it engages with a tooth. Your immediate question is going to be, but hang on, if I've got a flat belt on a flat surface, how does that work? We've got a CNC drive here. We've got to drive it accurately. You can't drive things accurately on flat surfaces. Agreed. Let's just go for this one step at a time. Now, everybody, I think, probably understands what a rack and pinion is. And let's just show you, excuse my terrible drawing. My art teacher once said to me, make sure you take up plumbing, boy. So there we go. There's the pinion and here's the rack. The rack is usually a solid lump of steel or some metal and the pinion engages with the teeth in here and when this drives that way, it drives that way. Okay, so how does that help us? Well, look, we've got the belt turned over and that looks very much like a flexible rack. Not a steel solid rack, but a nice flexible rack. It's a fairly simple step now to show you that if I put a plain roller there and a plain roller there and a plain roller down here, instead of having a solid rack, what I have is a flexible rack that engages with the teeth Whoops, and the, and the flat side of the belt is running round there like that. So we have got a flexible rack and pinion drive system and that completely cures this curtains problem. And I've not had a single problem at any speed with this machine. 
And up until the point where Claude Ray said, we'd like to try and build a Russ spec machine, I had a bit of a bodge system running. Because I couldn't send Cloud Ray my bodge system, I had to design something that would do the job properly. Now I did something that did the job properly on my China Blue machine, but that was based on this here being a 16 tooth pinion. The more modern machines are probably something like about 30 teeth, 24 to 30 teeth. So they're bigger, everything is different. So when I got my Tangerine Tiger machine, which is basically a copy of the China Blue machine, it had a different drive system in it like this. So as well as having a design to suit the Tangerine Tiger machine, which has got a much bigger hole in the bottom there to take the bigger pinion. I've also got another version here, which as you can see, the dimensions here are different. The holes in the bottom are different. There are lots of variations between the two. Now I've got a pretty fair idea that that will suit both machines, whereas this one will only suit a 16 tooth China Blue type machine. I will give you all the belt details, but you'll find that probably, even for a 300 by 500 machine, this belt is around about probably 40 pounds. So none of this is really cheap. It's all very worthwhile doing and it's not incredibly expensive. I haven't yet put a price on these, um, but I will do so at the end of this video. And I will put some sort of list in the description of the prices for these parts as of today. Although this is actually quite heavy as a unit, it's probably two kilograms, but it will go in a fairly small box and probably might go normal mail. I've got to investigate the cost of that and the cost of postage. And again, I think the sensible thing to do will be to put that as a separate cost. Now, in addition to that unit there, you do really need a new motor mounting bracket because I've had to push the motor further that way to get this whole assembly to fit onto the machine properly. If you go into my Tangerine Tiger series and you'll see me fitting this and developing this for the machine. We've got several years worth of work and development here that has culminated in this combination of mishmash of bits and pieces. I hopefully have explained the various options and alternatives that you might want to suit your machine. If I can help you in any way, then please contact me. The normal way to contact me through a comment is to disguise your email in some way, shape or form so that it can't be picked up by bots and add it to a comment and, and I will answer back and give you the information that you require. Data packs on each one of these parts, on several of the parts. It depends what package you want. I will look at each package that everybody wants and give you a quote for the mailing cost. Because if you want one of these and one of these and one of these and one of these, if we bundle them all together, they're obviously going to be cheaper than if we send them separately. We're beginning to run out of subjects to do with this laser machine. We've still got the four inch lens questions to answer. And that's one of the things that I shall have to be looking at in the future. I should be jumping back onto this with the Tangerine Tiger series because I've got to do comparisons between what an RF machine can do and what a CO2 laser can do. And that's going to be a fascinating series for the future. Thank you very much for your time and patience again, and I'll see you in a future session. <laughs>